Hey everybody, welcome to the Home Recording Made Easy.com podcast. This is episode number four. My name is David Vignola, and this week we're going to talk about the five things that I do at the beginning of every mix to set up my mix for success. So I'm going to give you five things so you can set up your mix for success. And then we're going to answer a couple of questions in this week's mailbag. And then if you stay till the end of the episode, I'm going to give you a couple of free gifts. So make sure you like, subscribe, give me a good review if you like this podcast and make sure you stick around to the end of the episode. So now let's jump right on in. Let's give you five things that you can use every single mix to set up your mix for success right here on the Home Recording Made Easy.com podcast. Okay, welcome back to another week. Again, this is episode four. Thank you so much for taking some time out of your day to listen to this podcast. So this week, I want to give you five things or tell you about the five things that I do at the beginning of every mix, set up by mix for success. I encourage you to try these things yourself, and this will help you not only set up your mix for success, but more importantly, make your mixes more consistent, help develop a workflow for you, and it's going to help you mix songs faster. Time is money, and we always want to get done as quickly as possible with the highest uh, quality possible. Um, so we're going to use these five things to help us go in that direction. So Tip number one, or the first thing that I want to talk to you about is start off with using or creating and then using yourself a mixing template at the beginning of every mix. So if you don't use templates, this is a great opportunity. The very next project you do, set yourself up, open up a song file in your DAW, an empty session, and go ahead and let's create yourself a template. Now, things that you want to include in your template are make sure that your routing for your audio interface is set up correctly. Make sure you, if you're using any kind of buses or effects channels, you can add those empty buses and effects channels to your template. You can even go ahead and use some of your go-to plugins and load those into your template and turn off the powered buttons on those plugins so you're not using them when you uh, first start off until you physically turn them on. But if you have certain plugins you use every single mix, go ahead and load them into a session um, and then go ahead and um, and save that as a template, as a mixing template. This will help you. So every time you start a mix, you don't have to open a session file, you know, uh, you know, set up all your effects, set up all your plugins, set up all your buses, set up all your all your audio routing. If you do that and set yourself up a template, that is going to make your workflow much much faster. So I have lots of templates that I use. I use a couple different ones for mixing, depending on the type of mix that I'm doing. I have some for recording. I have one even for this podcast that I'm recording. So using templates is great. I have some videos on the Home Recording Made Easy YouTube channel that you can check out as well, where I show you exactly how I set up my template, but consider using templates. And in this case, a specific mixing template, this will help you set up your mix for success. Item number two is after you import your audio files into your mixing session, name your tracks, clean your tracks, color code your tracks, do any kind of fade ins and fade outs, add song section markers, and those type of housekeeping items I do as the very first thing I do after I import my audio files, I go through, I name all my files, name all the tracks, make sure they're named accordingly. I color code them into a color scheme that makes sense to me. So every single mix, for example, my drums are always the color brown. My guitars are always a different shade of green. My lead vocals are always in yellow. Horns are always in purple, so on and so forth. So from one mix to the next, I can quickly look at my screen and I know exactly what I'm looking at without even having to really read the name of the track. That's super important. And then you want to make sure that at the beginning of the song, at the end of the song, you do any fade ins and fade outs. So as the playhead moves across the, uh, the audio, you don't get any clicks and pops and audio artifacts. That's always super important. You also uh, want to make sure that you add any uh, section uh, song section markers, things like intro, chorus, verse, breakdown, those kinds of things, solo, so you can navigate through the course of your mix going from one song section to another very, very quickly. So that's something that will help you also set up your mix for success because it helps with your workflow. It keeps things neat and organized from one mix to the next. Everything starts to look the same with the template and the same color tracks and the same names for tracks and those things. It'll just help speed up your workflow and help you set up your mix for success. 
Tip number three, next thing that I do after I uh, import all my audio files and do all that housekeeping that I just mentioned, is I typically will strip the silence from the audio regions or events to clean up the edit screen where you don't see audio being played. So for example, um, toms, rack toms, tom toms, drum toms, um, in between the drum hits that the drummer plays, there's always that, that, uh, that, uh, that the sections between the tom hits where you hear a little bit of the mic bleed or you hear a little bit of the rumbling of the toms, all that, all, all that section that he does not play or she does not play, I strip all of those out. So all I have on the tom tracks are just where they actually strike the drums. Getting rid of all that dead space in between is going to do two things. Number one, it's going to kind of clean up your, your edit screen so you're looking uh, at things in a much more neat and or orderly way on the screen. It's a little bit easier on the eyes. But more importantly, number two, is it cleans up any of the mic bleed, any of the low end rumble, things that are going to give, in this case, your drums a very kind of a muddy kind of a sound. Um, you don't want any of that. So I clean all the tom tracks is, is the very first thing I do. Then I look at our lead vocal and background vocal tracks. If it's a vocal song that has um, not a lot of vocal passages in it and there's big gaps between vocal phrases, again, I like to go in and cut all that out so I don't hear any of the headphone bleed from the singer's headphones, don't hear anything, uh, you know, bumping into mic stands and into music stands and those kinds of things. Get rid of all that stuff. Again, it'll look easier on the screen. It's easier to navigate with your eyes and it also cleans out any of that headphone bleed or anything that's going to muddy up the bottom end of your mix. And the same thing with background vocals as well. So typically it's the tom tracks on drums, lead vocals, background vocals, but also things like guitars. If there's like, let's say, an acoustic guitar playing through the song and it only plays through the choruses, well, in the verses where it's not playing, Cut all that stuff out. Get rid of all of it. Even if there's no audio that's physically there, get rid of all of it. It'll just make this the whole workflow just look so much more neat, orderly, and organized. And also, too, a lot of times, especially with things like guitars where they're only playing in certain sections of the song, but they're during the parts that they're not playing, they're actually sitting there and waiting for their chance to play. A lot of times you may not see the actual audio in the actual audio event on the screen, but if you were to zoom in really close, you'd see there's a little bit of rumble going on in the bottom, things that will kind of muddy up the mix. And I show examples of this in some of the videos on my YouTube channel. You can always go check those out, why that's important. So getting rid of the audio, or getting rid of the silence between the on the audio regions and events is going to really help not only clean up your mix, but it's going to make it look better on the screen, going to be easier to navigate with the eyes. And it's just something that I do as part of my workflow. And it helps set up your mix for success. It sure does. Number four is gain staging. The next step I do is I gain stage the sessions. Again, now if I have plugins that are loaded in on my template, I make sure all those plugins are turned off with the power buttons, as I said earlier. No processing at all. We want to turn up all the faders. We want to do a quick little static mix and we want to gain stage. Now I did a whole video on how to gain stage out on my YouTube channel. Again, those links will be in the description box and the show notes below. So you can check out those videos if you don't know what gain staging is. But basically what I want to do is I want to make sure when I turn up all my faders and all my instrumentation that I don't see any individual track clipping. So if I turn all my faders up to zero dB, you want to make sure nothing is clipping, nothing is uh, getting in the red as it will, as it were, and that the accumulative effect of all your tracks playing back when you look at your master fader, you're somewhere around a negative 10 to negative 12 dB. Now, starting off your mix with no plugins and no processing, being somewhere around a negative 10 to negative 12 dB is going to give you plenty of headroom to be able to add things like compression and EQ and saturation and tape processing and all the things, wonderful things that we're going to do with plugins throughout our mix. We want to make sure we give ourselves enough headroom. So negative 10 to negative 12 on the master bus is a good place to start and it's a real conservative way to make sure you don't run into any kind of clipping issues. So start off with each individual track. If you're starting off, let's say with your drums, bring your kick drum track up to zero dB on the fader. What's the output meter say? Are we clipping? Are we getting close to zero? If so, we wanna turn down that fader a little bit. We wanna make sure that again, all the individual tracks are somewhere around a negative 10, negative 12. And the accumulative effect of that is gonna leave you somewhere around a negative 10 on the master fader. Once again, it's hard to describe it exactly in a podcast, so click the link in the show notes below and go watch the video that I do on gain staging. It'll really help you start off your mix in a good place so your mix 
can be set up for success. How about that? Right. And the last thing I do after I gain stage is I sit back, take my hands off the mouse and the keyboard or off the surface control. If you have a, you have physical faders and I just listen from the top of the song to the bottom of the song, get a pad and a pen, or you can type the notes on your smartphone or tablet, whatever you want to use these days. And I listen and I take notes. I try to write down three things about what I'm hearing that I like about the song and what maybe three or four things I think need attention or I don't like about the song. Not about the quality of the song or the song writing or the arrangement, so to speak. That's more of a producer thing, but from a mixing point of view. So for example, you've done your static mix, you gain staged everything. No, there's no processing, so you're listening to raw tracks, but do you hear what, you know, what type of song is it? Is it a really guitar riff heavy kind of a song? That might be something where I say, I might write myself a note, you know, want to feature this lead guitar riff if in the intro of this song, maybe that's the, the focus instrument in that particular part of the song. Maybe you hear um, um, a, a snare drum that needs a lot of help and it needs to have a lot more crack. It's really flat and dull sounding. I might write that down. Pay attention to the snare and needs more crack. Notes, little notes like that. And I might write three or four or five things. Again, things I really like, things that I don't want to touch or things I want to highlight in the song when I'm going through the mixing process, as well as, you know, a handful of things, if there are that many of things that I need to pay attention to that I want to fix. So by writing those things down and not playing with plugins and not even looking at the screen, just kind of closing my eyes and listen, it kind of puts me in a direction. So when I start using processing like EQ, compression and those types of things, I've already got kind of a roadmap of what I'm really looking to do with the mix from a sonic point of view. Does that make sense? So by doing those five things, you're going to be consistent when you start every single mix, and it's going to help you set the table, if you will, to set up your mix for success. And if you do this after three or four mixes, you'll find a couple of things. One, your mixes turn out a lot more consistent from mix to mix. Two, you have a much more streamlined workflow, and therefore you're going to be able to mix faster with better results. And this is all part of a workflow thing that takes time to takes time to develop. But if you start off with these five things, it's going to point you in the right direction. So go ahead and rewind the episode and write those five things down. If you didn't do so already, put it on a piece of paper, put it in front of your uh, mixing workstation. The next time you mix a project, try those five things. And I can assure you it is going to help you set up your mix for success. Now let's move over to the next segment of the show. We're going to answer a couple of questions that came in last week in this week's mailbag. Okay, this week on this week's mailbag, we have two questions that we're going to try to answer from our faithful viewers and followers. I appreciate you so much writing in these questions. If you want to write one of your questions, I'll feature it on one of the episodes of the mailbag. This week, our first question comes from Matt Stonewell, and Matt writes in, Hey Dave, what tips do you have to teach someone how to better use compression? I use compression in my mixes, but I struggle to hear the effect as I turn the knobs on the plugin. It seems no matter what settings I use, it always sounds the same. Any advice? Thanks, Matt. Well, Matt, thanks for writing in. Yeah, that's the number one problem with a lot of beginning mixers is the number one uh, more, or more div most difficult, I feel, thing it is to kind of get when you're first starting out mixing is how to use compression and more importantly, how to hear compression. This is a very common problem, Matt, and happens to all of us. It's something that um, takes a little bit of time to learn how to hear compression. So when you're turning the knobs on those compressors, you hear audibly what's going on. And once you first discover it, you hear it for the first time, it opens up, a it's like a cloud has been lifted. Um, and so honestly, you know, not selling, not trying to sound like a cheap salesman here, but honestly, the best thing that I can recommend to anyone who struggles with hearing compression is to go to homerecordingmadeeasy.com and get Compression Made Easy. It's a training course for beginners and intermediates, and we talk not only about that whole concept, we do a ton of A-B comparisons, so I show you and teach you how to listen for compression, what to listen for. We compare the sounds of different types of compressors by different plug-in manufacturers. It's a wonderful course, Compression Made Easy at HomeRecordingMadeEasy.com. Now, if you stick around till the end of the episode, you're going to get a little bit of a discount. So stick around, and you're going to get that at 30% off. 
You hear that? So if you stick around to the end of the episode, I have something that's going to help you get compression made easy at a 30% discount. So stick around. So that would be my advice to you without spending an hour talking about this. It is something that you can learn. It is something that you need to learn if you want to be better at the craft of mixing. And um, compression is something that is such a valuable tool. It's one of the two most important tools that we have as mix engineers, the other being EQ, um, to really help make or break your mix. And you need to learn how to hear compression. The good news is it's not as difficult as you may think. And don't feel bad about not being able to hear it, Matt, because none of us were able to hear it when we first started. But compression made easy will help you, I promise. So thank you for writing in. Uh, the next question for this week's mailbag comes in from Sandy Green. Sandy, how are you? And she writes in, hi, David. What is your opinion, excuse me, what is your opinion on mixing using presets. I personally find that most plugin presets are not very usable. Do you ever use presets when you mix? Thanks, great podcast. Sandy Green. Thank you, Sandy. I'm glad you like the podcast. Um, presets on when working with plugins. Okay, here's my take on presets. Um, I find that presets are great for beginners that not really sure, for example, let's talk about EQ. How do you EQ a kick drum? Um, you could pull up your stock EQ or any third-party plug-in EQ, and they'll give you um, some presets on kick drums. And that is a good starting point. So you can see the EQ curve that they use for that particular kick drum, and then you can take it from there and shape it to your liking. The pro And that's a great uh, starting point and a great training aid for beginners. The thing that's not good about presets, and the reason why you find that most of them are unusable, is because it all really depends on the source that you're listening to. So for example, the way I EQ one kick drum in our example is gonna be different from the way I would EQ the next kick drum. There are so many variables to the way that that, that particular kick drum was recorded. What type of drum is it? How, what size of the drum is it? Was the microphone placed in or outside the kick drum? What kind of kick microphone did you use? What kind of beater was on the kick drum pedal hitting the batter head? There are, and, and there's many others. What kind of room was it in, et cetera, et cetera. Etc. Et so those things are going to really heavily dictate how I would EQ that kick drum. So a preset is just going to kind of get you in the ballpark with the most common frequencies. Like if you want a little bit more thumping your kick drum, it's going to be somewhere around that 60 hertz range. You want to cut out a little bit of the mud, it's going to be somewhere around that 240 uh, hertz range, so on and so forth. So the presets are great for that. But mixing solely with presets, I think is a bad idea. And the thing I don't like about presets it's kind of the lazy man's or lazy woman's, if you will, way out of really learning, in our example, EQ, understanding fundamental frequencies around instrumentation, how to use EQ effectively, same thing with compression. Um, so I don't like presets because it's kind of a cheater way and it kind of doesn't force you to really learn the mechanics around things like EQ and compression. That's what I don't like about the presets is, um, is that it really it doesn't force you to really, to really learn this stuff, okay? It's kind of the, taking the easy way out. And again, a lot of times the presets really aren't gonna work for you, although like I said, they'll get you in the ballpark. Now, there are some exceptions to that. There are times, and a lot of times, you asked if I use presets. Yes, yeah, sometimes I use presets again as a starting point and then I take it and I tweak it depending on what it is. Uh, different plug-in manufacturers, some have more what I would call usable presets than others. Um, and again, it's all from experimentation. Um, and so it really depends on the plugins that you're using. So the short answer is I don't mix with presets solely. Just pull up the preset and don't make any changes. Never does that happen. I'm always tweaking the preset when I do use them. And two, I would more rather see my students and you, Sandy, really learn in this case, we're talking about EQ. Um, instead of worrying about a preset, let's learn how do we EQ a kick drum, for example, in, this, in our example. What is the fundamental frequency of a kick drum? Where do you normally cut some of the mud or some of the boominess out of a kick drum? Those types of things. And once you have that information with you, you're not going to need to rely on presets. So I hope that makes sense. And again, we're talking a little bit about EQ. And the last question, we talked about compression made easy. Well, I also have a course called EQ Made Easy. So once again, you can go to homerecordingmadeeasy.com and you can learn about different instrumentation and the fundamental frequencies and how you can learn how to use EQ without having to rely on presets. EQ Made Easy will be great for that. So again, stick around till the end of the episode and you'll find out how you can get that course 
at another discount, just like Compression Made Easy. So Sandy, thank you for writing in. And that is it for this week's mailbag. Once again, I want to thank all of you for listening to this episode. Again, we're at episode four. We're rocking and rolling now. If you like this podcast and you find it helpful to you, please give me a review. Give me the thumbs up, like, and subscribe and share. It really does help me. And the more feedback and the more, um, you know, the more interactive I can become with you, the audience, the more motivation it's going to give me to make even more of these episodes. So I really do appreciate that. Now, like I said at the beginning of the show and how I kind of alluded a couple of times now. I want to give you a couple of free things to help you out. So the first thing I want to give you, if you have not been to homerecordingmadeeasy.com, I want you to go to homerecordingmadeeasy.com because I want to give you five free mixing training courses. That's right. I want to give you five free courses. It's my way to say thanks to you just for visiting homerecordingmadeeasy.com. It's worth about 210 bucks right on the homepage. You can't miss it. Link will be in the show notes below. Home Recording Made Easy, get your five free mixing training courses. And then also in the show notes, I want to give you a coupon code. The coupon code is PODCAST30. Again, it'll be listed below this episode here, PODCAST30. You can use that at checkout to take 30% off any training course on my website. That includes Compression Made Easy and in and EQ Made Easy. So you can get those at 30% off. So we're talking about EQ and compression this time around. Go check out those courses. Get them at 30% off using the coupon code PODCAST30. And talking about mixing, if you really want to learn mixing in a very non-technical way, which is perfect for beginners and intermediates, then I invite you to check out my mixing membership website, mixingmadeeasy.net. Once again, links will be in the show notes description box below. Check out mixingmadeeasy.net. It is the number one mixing training membership website online, anywhere, at any price point, bar none. And you got to believe me because I'm a little biased. <laughs> so anyway, check out mixingmadeeasy.net. There's a promotional video on there. I tell you all about what you get. You can try it out for a month. You don't like it. You can always cancel your subscription. It is super affordable, less than 50 cents a day. And you're going to get an enormous amount of mixing training where we talk about the these five things we talked about in this episode, among a bunch of others. And we dive down deep into the craft of mixing. So if you really want to learn mixing, mixingmadeeasy.net. And that is it for episode four. We have an entire month's worth of stuff already in the can. And I really do appreciate all of you listening from episode one right through episode four. Join me next week for episode five, where we're going to be talking about everything home studio related, recording, mixing, mastering, studio gear, and much, much more. My name's been Dave with HomeRecordingMadeEasy.com and MixingMadeEasy.net. Thank you so much for listening, and I will speak to you all next week. Take care. <laughs> <laughs>